they all have very strong, we all have very strong positions and different things that we hold to um, that may slightly differ from one another. Okay, that's just true. I mean, there's, there, I, I don't, I don't pretend, I don't pretend like all of us agree about, like I'm not in a fake bubble where I actually believe that everybody agrees with everything that, that, that I believe in the sense of, you know, I think in the big picture, we all do. I think when you start getting down to, to small, minute details of things, of different things, there's going to be disagreements. Uh, that's okay, because this is not a cult. So it, it, it's, actually, it's actually okay, because you didn't check your personality or your right of conscience uh, at the door, right? You, we don't do that. We, we, have, we believe in liberty of conscience here. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of that tonight a little bit. And we're going to bring up some different kind of philosophies a little bit as we look at these philosophers. And I'm going to bring home a few things in the beginning. And I'm doing this not because I'm, I, I, I have this one-lined agenda or fear of something, but it's, it's actually a preventative thing, I believe. I, I hear sometimes um, groans of things that go on and conversations that take place and disagreements and things. And... For me as a pastor, I am, I, am, I am very far away from the fear of somebody's differences threatening me. I, I'm, I'm not there now. Like, I used to be there, I'll be honest with you. And I used to handle things differently because I would react in fear to different things that would come up or different positions or, or different things that would happen. It would, it would make me a little bit uncomfortable. But as the Lord has brought me through some things in my life and in the ministry, experience-wise and, and everything, I've learned who real enemies are, right? And I've learned who friends are that disagree. I, I've learned the difference in that. I've also learned in the difference of how you deal with that, you know, as a, especially when it's an everyday uh, relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, so I, I think what I'm going to do is, is kind of meet out or give out some, some uh, helpful instructions and some direction and probably a little bit of correction and, um, and preventative uh, maintenance, so to speak, preventative things that can, that can keep us, uh, by the grace of God, can keep us walking in fellowship and love one with another uh, and not get sidetracked or not get get taken off course or subverted by something. Do you understand? I, there's a balance there of, uh, of, of all of us having those different kind of, I, I, I'm using a lack of a better term, philosophy, but when you understand the definition of philosophy, that's what actually some of it is. It, it is philosophies. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, our differences that we may have and even some of the differences in raising our children, even some of the differences in what you allow your children to do and what I allow my children to do. Uh, the differences in what you eat and what I eat, right? The differences in uh, Calvinism, Armenianism, or any other ism, dispensationalism or any other ism, right? Those things. I'm not afraid to touch any of those things tonight. I'm not afraid to tell you that the only thing that I'm concerned about is none of those positions. I'm concerned about your dispositions. Do you understand that? Like, I, I think it's healthy for men to study things out. I think it's actually healthy for men that they disagree on things, and they wonder about things, and they question things, and they think about things. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What I think is wrong is if you come to a place where you become uncharitable in the way that you deal with it, Right? And you treat everything the same way, as if a man that, that believes something is a heretic, if he doesn't agree with you. Those are the extremes that, in, our, in the way that we deal with things, that we have to be careful with. All of us have to be. Why? Because I happen to believe, as I look out, that there's a lot at stake. Like, I just don't think tonight's at stake. I just don't think tomorrow is. I think future generations and how we deal with things now are at stake. I think they matter. I think 
if we don't have a good testimony of how we deal with differences in this assembly and how we deal with some theological differences that we may have and things of that nature, I think that some of our kids can run out and curse God and say, I'm done with all of you. Amen. That like, I think they can see that kind of contention for that needless contention sometimes. I'm not talking about contending for the faith, but needless contentions and strifes over things that, you know what? You beat down your brother so much, they ain't going to their pastor. You talk bad about your pastor. You talk bad about your brother in Christ. They're not going to ever go to them if they get in trouble. Why would they go to them? You've already bashed them and destroyed them. You've already, you've already labeled them basically because of some disagreements. You've already rendered it. So those kids are looking at them like, well, who do I go to? I mean, I don't, I'm washing my hands of all of it. That, that can happen, by the way. I'm, absolutely. It can. So I think it's important that, that, we, that we beware of philosophy-infused theology, and we also be aware of our differences not, not consuming us. Right? Acts 17, verse number 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray you be with us now and help us. Guide our steps, Lord. Comfort our hearts. Teach us, correct us, guide us. Help us, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, Paul takes on these philosophers. He goes head to head with them right in the middle and he takes them on right away. I mean, he goes right down in the middle of them. And actually, they find him. I mean, he's out there speaking, and it isn't very long before uh, they all find him, and they're like, what's this guy talking about, right? He goes head to head to them. Now, we're going to look at some of those philosophies and different things. We're going to define the word philosophy tonight. We're going to look at what that word means, all right? Then we're going to look at these two groups in the end. Hopefully we have enough time. We'll, we'll look at these two groups. Why is that important? Because you and I face these two groups today. Like these two groups are still out there today in different variations, in different forms. These Epicureans and the Stoics are out there today. Isn't it interesting how the truth was like kind of right in the middle of those two the whole time? And they just couldn't grasp it because both sides were the absolute opposites of each other. They were both, the, they were the absolute opposites of each other. And they were both wrong. <laughs> they were absolutely 100% both wrong about what they thought, about what they believed. Their philosophies were the philosophies of men. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of, of the world, and not after Christ. Why? Just like that song, Only Jesus, Only Jesus, right? All for Jesus, all for Jesus, that song we just sang. Think about this for a second. What's that verse say, verse 9? He talks about the philosophies of men in verse 8. Then what does he say? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus. So he's, he's saying, you know, beware of those philosophies of men spoiling you. Because in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus is everything and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power so he gives us those directions so number one first we're going to define what a philosopher is literally it means the love of wisdom but in modern exception acceptation it, philosophy is a general term denoting an explanation of the reason of things or an investigation of the causes of all phenomena both of the mind and of matter so it's trying, to, it's trying to systemize something. It's trying to figure out how something works. Start to make sense? When applied to any particular department of knowledge, it denotes the collection of general laws or principles under which all the subordinate phenomena or facts relating to that subject are comprehended. Thus, that branch of philosophy which treats of God is called theology. That which treats of nature is called physics or natural philosophy. So that which pertains to God, the philosophy of man, which treats of God, is called theology. So then is it any wonder that men have their systems of theology? 
And every man has a different one. I mean, I can show you. I can show you Adam Clark's and uh, not Clark's, but uh, the, the Methodist. I can show you Gill's Body of Divinity. Um, I, I can show you a vast number of different theological uh, Thomas Watson's Body of Divinity. Uh, I can show you a vast numbers of, of body. Uh, here's another one of Gill's Practical and Doctrinal Body of Divinity. Any one of these men, all of these men, Baptist, Protestant, uh, Reformers, Whoever they are, they all have a systematic, the Schaefer's systematic theology, which is, which is geared towards uh, dispensationalism. Okay, so you have Schaefer's dis, uh, dispensation or Schaefer's systematic theology. That is his philosophy of God that he systemized from the scriptures, no doubt. I don't question the man's integrity or his, or his desire or Gill's or anybody else's, but that's their philosophy. Those are their thoughts. Those are the facts that they've gathered up, and those are the conclusions that they've come to. Right? Are you following me? So it's their philosophies. It's their, it's their philosophies. So... The objects of philosophy are to ascertain facts or truth and the causes of things or their phenomena, to enlarge our views of God and his works, and to render our knowledge of both practically useful and subservient to human happiness. True religion and true philosophy must ultimately arrive at the same principle. Hypothesis, a philosophy is a hypothesis or a system on which natural effects are explained. Right? Reasoning, argumentation. Right? Those are philosophy. That's part of philosophy. Courses of science read in, in schools. So then in essence, all systematic theologies of men, or that men try to take the concept of God, his person and his works, right, and put them into a system. But at best, they are still the philosophies of men. I will tell you that hands down. I... I I've read after some of the greatest minds ever, men that love the Lord and men that everything else. And I'm telling you, there's still men. If you think that they can take the concept of who God is and systemize it and it be perfect, then you think your, your main philosopher, then you, what you're telling me is that your philosopher is infallible. And I will tell you, no, he's not. I will tell you that there are flaws in his systematic theology. How? Because he systemized God, and he did his best to do it, and I don't say it's not a noble effort. I'm not even saying it's wrong. I'm saying I'm not to take that as the Bible. Amen. I'm to take Christ and his word as the, as the Bible, as the word of God, right? This is why I don't believe there's a perfect systematic theology out there, because they are written by fallible men. So then I look at Calvin's writings and the Calvinists, and I see shades of Augustine and his philosophies. Who was trained in philosophy? They are philosophies. They are. They are. Right? And I personally see the human error in the five points. Now, you may not like me saying that, but that's never stopped me before from saying it. I just do. I see human error in those. Why? Because man is trying to take something as great as God and say, I have him all figured out, every jot and tittle. And here's the system you have to follow. And if you don't follow that system, then you're just not right with God. Then you must be labeled a heretic, and you must be this, and, and we must be done with you. Right? I just marvel at the pride of men, how they believe that they have that systematically down so much. That any one of those men can tell you that, well, if you don't follow this, then you must not be orthodox. Well, what happens if I just follow the Bible and I don't come to the same conclusion you do? What happens when I don't? And what happens if you don't get to dictate the power of God in my life and what God does with my ministry, even though I don't line up with your, with your system? And you have never been able to stop the work of God. It's never stopped. And I've never adopted those things. And it's never stopped. I've never seen God not work in this ministry or see souls saved and lives changed. Amen. And I've never had to be that. Hey. And I've never had to espouse that before. And I've never had to grasp that. Why? 
because I'm too stupid to. I'll be honest with you. I'm not as smart as those people. So what I have to do is get on my knees and say, God, I don't even know what they're talking about. I don't understand what they're saying. I don't get their systematic stuff. I don't get how they know where God's, where man's personal responsibility meets with God's sovereignty and they've got it perfectly fit out and everything else. I, I don't. And you know what? Furthermore, I don't believe it's my job to. I don't believe it's anybody's job to. To be honest, I, I don't think it is. And just because some guy made up a systematic theology years ago after he burnt some other dude over in, over in Geneva, I'm supposed to follow it and I'm supposed to feel like I'm indebted to that man who hated my guts and would have burned me if I was there? Who got his from Augustine, who's a philosopher? Who hated me too? And hated everybody. And I'm supposed to follow those and say like, oh, you're God. I'm going to follow your system. No, I'm not. I'm not because I don't believe it. I, I do not believe that I, am, I owe anything to that. I do not believe I have to see the, the, my Bible through the eyes of, of five points. Because my Bible is bigger than five points. It's way bigger than five points. On either side, who's ever five points they are, or six points, or how many ever points they want? It's bigger than that. And it matters to me because I'm tired of seeing people. You know what happens? I've watched that stuff eat up churches, and people run with that. Look, I don't even have a problem if you believe that. I don't personally have a problem with that. I don't. I don't agree with it, but I don't have a problem with it. Why is that? Because I'm secure that I believe the God of the Bible will guide you into all truth, just like he guides me into all truth. And I'm at peace with what God shows me. And I'm at peace at learning from people that I disagree with. I'm at peace with that. I can actually learn from people, right? Paul, I could take a book on geocentricity, and if the guy's a Catholic priest or a Jesuit, if I, I can look at that and say, oh, okay, well, he's talking about, like, just plain what's there, science. I mean, just, like, right there, like. Right? Now, I'm not going to take my theology from the guy. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to break down systematic theology from the guy. Right? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to study the, I'm not going to study his, his, his doctrine of salvation. I'm not, but I, I get he's writing about something. Right? He's writing about something he knows about. Okay. Do I believe everything he says? No. I don't believe everything I say sometimes. <laughs> okay? Sometimes I'm like, man, did I just say that? Right? You're like that too, aren't you? Sometimes you're like, man, maybe I shouldn't have said that. My, my point is, is that I have seen people tear the house down over disagreements. Tear it down. So great. They got a flag up with their five points on, but nobody's there to listen. Or it destroyed the faith of some. Or it got them carried about with every wind of doctrine. It got them scared away. It got them, it got them so they're just discouraged by everything. Right? I mean, I've seen that stuff do that in churches. It, clear them out. Ruin them. Send a coldness and a deadness to them. Right? I see the human error in the sight of the works of Arminius and the Armenians and Wesleyan theology. After all, you're literally trying to take the infinite God and his works and turn them into a systematic theology, which is in and of itself tainted by the thoughts of men and their crude understanding of who God is. And I know you're going to say, yeah, but I took everything I had from the Bible and no man taught me that. I figured all that out myself. Now, that may be the case, and that would be amazing because I don't know where you saw it because I didn't see it in there. Not to say you couldn't see something like that in there, but... I didn't see most of the terms that are used in there, so I know some man had to systemize that for you and show you that. There's nothing wrong with man teaching you. I'm just saying. We get that from experiences and things that were taught from others. I'm not, that, that's just being honest, right? It's being honest. That's what it is. Does that, let me ask you a question. Do you know any man that claims their systematic theology to be infallible? That it is without error and perfect? Do you know any man? Do you, do you, you've read books. Do, you, do any of those men do that? I don't, I don't know any that does. So then I should be awful careful if I'm going to build a hill to die on, that I don't die on something that's not infallible. Right? I should die on the hill of Christ, but I should not die on the hill of men's words. I should not. 
I'll die on the hill of Christ, but I'm sure not going to die for Calvin's words or his system or any other sovereign grace Baptist or anybody else. I'm going to die for Christ on that hill, but for man's systems, no. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Do you, do you get what I'm getting at here? That you can be so close to the truth and philosophy can just can, can take over and the differences that you have can take over and they become monumental and they, become a, and they affect everyone. You have to be careful. Systematic theology is our noble attempt, and I do say a very noble attempt, to understand the infinite and the infallible God. That's what it is. I shudder to think that whatever system you lean towards in your understanding of theology, that you would claim an infallible inspiration in that as equal to the scriptures. What I would say to you then, if you can't, I would ask you very kindly that you not attempt to force me to adopt a portion of those men's thoughts on God and then think ill of me if I don't line up myself with either of them. Fair enough? Seems like it. I will say I greatly respect the Baptists and even the Baptist Calvinists. And there were many of them. See, I'm honest with history. I won't lie. I, I, I want to tread on light ground because I don't want to be unkind to anybody that mentored me. So I, I'll leave names out for now. But there are some of my teachers that taught me Baptist history that they did not exactly tell the entire story of Baptist history. They left some things out that should have been in there. They left some things out, and it kind of skewed the thinking of some Baptists. Part of that was because of the influence of fundamentalism, and they were scared to say the word Calvinism, because when, if you say Calvinism around an independent, fundamental, Jack Hiles Baptist, you might just end up like, like Severus in, in Geneva. I mean, that's how, that's how bad it is if you mention that word to independent fundamentals. But I want you to understand very closely, I've never let these people put me in a box. I, if you get mad at me tonight for every, anything that I say, I'll get over it, <laughs> okay? I'm, gonna, I, I'm not trying to be unkind, but I'm telling you that I, but I, I, want, I will be honest with you with history, that Baptist history is loaded with general Baptists and particular Baptists. And those two strains did much for God. Many of them did. Were they wrong at things? Yeah, just like you and me. Do I, do I agree with all their positions? Nope. I don't have to either. And neither do you, but I'm not going to lie and say that God never used them either. However, I will say this, that the Baptists that, that, that were Calvinist Baptists, that called themselves Calvinist Baptists, they were never accepted by the Presbyterians. So the Presbyterians looked at them and were like, you're not even Calvinist. We don't even like you. Because they didn't like them. Why? Because ba those Baptists that were Calvinists could not shake the Baptist part of, of who they were, which meant what? Liberty of conscience. Individual soul liberty, right? Church autonomy. So all of those things, those five, first five uh, are, are the, uh, the first principles. Yeah, the first principles rendered them like not very likable to everybody else. Like they still didn't matter what they believed about certain things, right? But the point is that like John Clark and Obadiah Holmes, I can show you they were moderately Calvinists in their positions. I can show it to you. I can show you in their writings. They were. Does that mean I have to agree with them? No. Nope. Anyway, down through the centuries, there's always been a battle, even among Baptists, about Calvinism versus Arminianism. That'll never change. It'll be there when we're dead. And then there is a battle as to the degree one takes it to. Most men that are Baptists that lean toward those five points do not lean into Presbyterianism, so their bent is not enough to be accepted by others. So in all actuality, they probably would never be accepted by Puritans or modern-day Puritans. And that's my point. The only way Calvinists are accepted today, for the most part, by, their, by, the, by uh, Baptists that call themselves Calvinists are accepted by Presbyterians is if they don't make a big deal about baptism then they're accepted. But if you make a big deal about scriptural baptism, you are out of the club. You're, you're not going to be in the club. That's the way it goes. 
Why am I bringing this up? Because we're talking about philosophies, and that's largely what these are. And if some in this room lean one direction or the other, I know this about every man in this room. Listen to me very closely. I understand this about every man in this room the best I can, that to the best of my knowledge, every man in this room and woman in this room, they love the Lord. Every man wants to raise their family for Christ. They want to live in holiness and separation, and they want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Are we all in agreement about that? Right? I don't know anybody that doesn't. So my point is, Christ is the main point always. Christ trumps everything. It trumps the philosophies of men. And you know what? I, I'm going to tell you what. The one thing in maturity that you have to learn the hard way, and, and, it, and uh, you know what it takes? It, it almost takes getting kicked in the guts a couple times, and then when you're down on the ground, getting kicked a few more times, and then somebody comes by and soccer kicks your face a couple times before you realize that there's just going to be people that love you that they don't always agree with you. And you're going to have some differences with them. And you're just going to have to love them anyway. Right? I'm not talking about, you know, um, damnable heresies and things of the, of the nature of Christ and things. Of, I'm not talking about that. That's a whole different. That's, that's, we cannot compromise who Christ is. That can never happen. That can never happen. But look around at your brothers and understand that. And remember what God said to us, all men shall know this by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. Amen. Right. If you have love one to another, I'm not going to be like you always and you're not going to be like me always. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you're wrong. Right. And it doesn't. And, and we're not always going to agree and we could have strong, uh, strong positions. I'm not ever telling anybody to not have a strong position. But let me warn you that your theological bent in one direction or the other should not make you uncharitable with your brethren. It shouldn't. It should not lead to unchristian-like arguments. Your philosophical bent, and I mean that because part of it is just that, when men speak where God is silent and when men speculate upon the degrees of man's personal responsibility versus God's sovereignty and pretend they have it all figured out. If it takes you over, then pride comes forth. The Bible warns us that knowledge puffeth up, puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You know, the, a lot of you, I, I don't know if you realize this, but in this whole church, each one of you men, and I'm speaking to the men generally because I really don't deal with women very much, thank God. Um, not that I don't love you all. I pray for all of you, but I'll pastor you and do what, but I'm glad you got husbands because <laughs> that's, that's what they're for, amen? But uh, we have that order right, which is a blessing. And those that don't have, then they're under the watch care of the pastor and that, and that sort of thing. We, I rejoice in helping you too. Uh, but the point is, is that as I look at you men, each one of you have strengths in different things. So you have to be careful not to be threatened by somebody else's strength or not to be offended by it or whatever it is that God has taught them. I think it's interesting when we go out preaching, all the messages are different. All, because all the, but, but they're, all, they're all Christ. They're all on Christ and the gospel. But if I listen to all you men preach, you all preach differently. And that's okay. Because God's given you certain strengths and certain abilities like that. And that's the way, and, and certain things that God has taught you from the scriptures and made you sensitive to. And that's important. And a body needs that in order to be what God wants it to be. But if we're not careful then a matter of difference in the operation of the work of the Spirit that we see, if we can't be charitable and have grace and not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think and not love one another, and not be able to handle our differences, we're going to be in trouble. It's a surefire way of Satan destroying us. It just is. You know, some men lead towards what, what we call uh, a passivism. Some men to bear arms, uh, self-defense, and protect one another. Some have convictions on what level of engagement to have with government. Right? These are all matters of consciousness. 
All of them are. And we ought to respect each person's position, even if we don't agree with it. If it's wrong, we can share, or why we think it's wrong, we can share it. We can talk about it. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I mean, there's a lot of things that some of you have brought up that, that I may not agree 100%, but it's got me thinking. Got me thinking. Right? It makes me think about it. I start to think in my mind, and I start to meditate on some of those things. Like, you know, uh, like Brother Paul brought up about, you know, uh, uh, fighting and war and self-defense. I mean, it got me thinking. It got me meditating about it and thinking about it and thinking, you know what? What is the level that a Christian would take to and what What is responding? And, and that's going to be different, I think, for each man. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with having that conversation. There's nothing wrong with having conversations about election and, and about uh, predestination and about those things. And some people may come towards a stronger stand uh, on that than others or, a str or, or uh, uh, they believe, uh, you know, they may lean towards Calvinism in that right. Um, I don't believe any man believes that God sovereignly elects men just to go straight to hell. I don't think any man here believe that. Uh, what is that called? A double predestined or a double, I forget what it's called. What's that? Yeah, like I don't believe any man believes that here. But what I'm saying is that, you know what, though? There's differences. Men are going to have those differences. They're going to understand it. You know what else? You know what else happens? Your experiences shade some of the things that you believe. Some of the things that have befell you in your life and how you were saved, they shade kind of how, and the things that happen to your life, they kind of shade the direction of what you believe a little bit. Your philosophy a little bit, so to speak. Your thoughts about things. There, there isn't anything wrong with that. I hope I'm making sense. I hope I am. I can tolerate a man leaning in different directions like that than I do when it comes to some of those points and the outworkings of the Spirit. I'm not willing to tear my brother down or destroy him for it. I've learned a lot of painful lessons, necessary lessons about loving one another and not, not allowing myself. I, I've, I've had people that I thought were my friends be my complete enemies, and the ones that, were, that looked like my enemies were actually my friends. That's very humbling. So see, I'm not in a position like I guess some men are where they are so confident that they are right about certain things, about things that men have debated for years, uh, that they're willing to die on that hill for it when it comes to those, some of those things. I also think it's por important for us not to overreact to things. And we and brethren, we as brethren walk in unity, but we also have our own differences. If I take my differences with my brothers and, you know, okay, I'll give you an example. Philosophies of, of raising children. I, I mean that we all follow the principles of the scriptures. I believe everybody here does that. But some of the ways that you do things, some of the philosophies, some of the thoughts you have, they're going to be different. You're, we don't all do this. There's things that you let your family do that I wouldn't let my family do. There's things that I let my family do that you'd be like, no, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't let that bother me. I t my, my children sometimes will mention that to me, that, oh, well, so-and-so gets to do this, and they get to do that, and I say, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, that's so-and-so's family, and they, if they, that's okay. You know, but they don't do this. Yeah, well, that's okay. They don't have to. Right? I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned with you. You're my family. Right? And, and, and there, there's going to be differences. There's going to be things that you, you have. But what I'm saying is, if we're not careful, we can allow some of those differences to vaunt us up, to puff us up, where we actually think we're better Christians because of, of that or something. And we're, you know, I'm not talking about getting into sin and stuff like that. I'm, you know what I'm talking about, just differences of things. Right? And we'll think we're better. Right, well, I'm more devoted than you are, <laughs> right? Or food, that's another thing. Man, I'll tell you what, in the Bible, food is talked about in the New Testament as an, as an issue of contention. You know, as an issue of contention, we have to be careful about that as a church. You have to be careful that, that you don't get mad at Lee when he eats three Jimmy Johns. 
and I have to eat keto. I mean, I, I just, I. And can still jump into the pool, but not after, but not after three Jimmy Johns. I don't think he's doing it after three Jimmy Johns. But anyway, but the point is that, you know what? I don't think, I, I don't think that I'm better than Lee because I can do that. I, I actually think he's probably better because he can eat three of those and I can't. But, but I actually am really impressed with that, to be honest with you. I'm like, how do you put that in there? I've asked him more personal questions about that, but we won't get into that today. But, uh. How he actually deals with that, but anyway, but right, but think about that, okay? So there's differences, right? Some people are going to follow something stricter. There's people that are like more organic or more natural in their in their eating and everything, else, and they're just strict. If that ever becomes a, a a point of contention and you end up losing fellowship with your brothers over food, that's wrong. I'm going to tell you what, that's wrong. I'm going to tell you very plainly, that's wrong. It shouldn't matter to you what the guy next to you eats when it comes to that at all, period. Right, Brother Paul? When he's drinking his big Yeti cup of coffee? Or eating bugs. Or eating bugs? I'm not going to be jealous of his grasshoppers. <laughs> Although, Paul, I have a field in the back of my house, and it, I nicknamed it Grasshopper Field, and you are welcome to come and have a buffet. <laughs> I, I, I have a buffet waiting for you, right? It's all there. All right, well, I got plenty of them if you want some. Uh, they are back there. They are everywhere, and, and they are huge. So anyway, but, uh, but we have to be careful about that, right, that there's not, that, this certain, that we look at somebody and think, well, you know, they're this because of this, you know, and, and they, we don't do this, and they don't do that and everything, and we allow that to be a matter of separation. Shouldn't be, right? We had to be careful about that. And it, those are those are what that's what I'm talking about when I get down to like philosophy. See, but something as strong as the sovereignty of God and the operation of God. Yeah, but listen, friend, people have been debating that for thousands of years. And after we're gone, they're still going to be. And I don't pretend like I'm the, I'm not Augustine. So I don't pretend like I'm the guy that's going to come in and fix it all. By the time I'm done, you're all going to believe like me. I, I don't think so. And I don't have a sword and an army from Caesar to do it with. So uh, yeah, I, I don't. So I, I really don't believe that's going to happen, right? It's not. So let's be careful about the philosophies of men. Let's be careful about, and, and by the way, some may be deep held and, and, and convictions. And, and I'm not, I'm not uh, discrediting those. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not boiling those down to, your convictions and what you believe about God, I'm not boiling down to like nothingness, like it doesn't mean anything. What I'm saying is, if God hasn't been rocks, if God didn't ordain your system of theology, then you better be careful and stick to the King James Bible, and you better stick to the scriptures. If you understand something and you believe that that's the direction that God has you, I respect that. But is it worth, sitting, is it, is it worth dying on a hill alone for? Is it worth tearing people down? Is it worth destroying what God is doing in the lives of people in that sense or being a detraction from that? That's what you have to ask yourself. Is that what God wants me to do? You know, in Sandy Creek, when they came to that place, they had the Armenian and the Calvin. They came together and they had this. I mean, these guys were planting churches everywhere. And what happened? Well, there had to be some dissension creep in, right? There just had to be. And eventually it was creeped in. And what they, they had a conference together. And they all sat together and they tried to pound that thing out. And boy, I'll tell you what, they, I mean, you had men on both sides, men that started churches, men that preached the gospel. Men, I'm telling you what, you wouldn't have a problem with any of those men that were there in that sense. You'd have sat underneath all of them when they preached the word of God. I, th those that said they were Calvinists, those that said they were Armenians, those that led, they all preached the same gospel. They all walked around, the they all lived the same holy lives. They were all separated. They had some theological differences when it came down to that. Like, at what point does this happen? And you know what they had to do? Table it and walk away and say, we'll just love one another and go do our business. Because guess what? We ain't going to be able to, we ain't going to be able to fix this. We're not going to be able to come to that. Right? So I'd be very careful. I'd be very careful about that. We're all opinionated, right? Studied men. But with that must come a charity and a spiritual discipline, because knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. I've seen debates of theology tear up churches, destroy works. But let me ask you a question. 
you that have brothers and sisters in Christ here that have differences on maybe church matters or faith and practice, have they changed any way your brothers and sisters evangelize or your brothers in Christ evangelize or, or have they changed any way that you live your life as far as, I don't know any antinomians in this room. I don't know anybody that, I don't know anybody that doesn't believe in repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know anybody that believes in a salvation that doesn't change someone. I don't know anybody that believes any of those things, right? Why am I saying all this? Because I'm going to go ahead and put the fires of foolishness out quickly. Because they don't need to be there. Those, those, there's nothing wrong with discussing those things. There's nothing wrong with. What is wrong is if we become uncharitable and unloving. Right? That's, that's what we have to be careful of. Don't we see the same brothers and sisters walking in truth and holiness and raising their families in the fear of God? If you see the fruit of Christ in your brothers and sisters, don't allow Satan and don't allow pride to well up in your hearts and cause you to be uncharitable. Don't take the position you lean towards on differences in whether it's election or predestination or any theological differences to cloud the bigger picture. Look around you and see the children we are to be an example for. We can't be petty. I'm telling you what, the hour is too late. The day is dark. We can't be petty. We can't. We can't be thin-skinned. We can't be offended easily. We can't. Right? We just can't. We can't afford it. There's too much at stake. Too much. Too much to act that way. It's, it, to me, it's, it, it's just immaturity. When I, it's just that's what it is. And God will find ways to mature us when we don't act the way we should, right? So be careful. The greatest needs for God, God's people today is to live for Christ and take on the mind of Christ. All right, so that's there, those philosophies that, that I've seen in some of those, and I've covered all those areas, probably a great number of them, right? Except what kind of coffee you drink. I haven't talked about that really, right? Right? None. We won't talk about that either. I'm having to be charitable, Lee. I'm not going to bring that up. My dad keeps saying, you're going to grow up someday, though, but that's him, and he's 77, so he just says what he wants now. He just... Did she? Yeah. It hasn't worked, has it? No. You're a Toys R Us kid. You're never growing up. <laughs> right? Except Toys R Us is dead, so that's not good. We don't. You outlive Toys R Us. Remember Toys R Us? Even you remember Toys R Us. John doesn't. He's like, what's Toys R Us? I don't know what that is. You don't even know what they're talking about, do you? You do? You know what Toys R Us is? All right. We ready for these two philosophy groups here? Isn't it funny that there's two here? Always seems to be two philosophical groups wherever. Almost like problem, reaction, solution. Almost like, <laughs> almost like the Hegelian dialectic almost, right? Almost like that. But, but if you ask that each person on each side, they know they're right uh, when it comes to that, right? These two main prevailing philosophies ruled the city of Athens. Both of these sects, both of them dealt with the same questions. With man, his duty, his destiny, and his relation to the universe and to God. All those, they, they pondered those questions. Pretty much. Same today. So who then are the Epicureans? Who are these people? Followers of the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus. The Apostle Paul preached the gospel to some Epicureans in Athens here. Epicurus aimed to discover a practical guide to happiness. Does he sound like Joel Holstein or what? The, the guide to true happiness. Right? That's what he wanted. The guide to true happiness. That was nice of him. He wanted a systematic understanding to give you a guide to true happiness in life. That's sweet. Epicurus aimed to discover that. His search was for pleasure, but not absolute truth. So really, the Epicureans were just, I guess they were hedonists, wouldn't, wouldn't they be? They would be hedonist, and they, they really, or you can call them heathenists if you want to. Either way, it doesn't matter. But, um, right, eat, drink, 
and be merry for tomorrow we die. So Paul talks about that in the scriptures, right? He's referencing these philosophers because that was the philosophies of the world at the time. The Greek culture had dominated the world through the Roman Empire. It was everywhere. And those philosophies, those philosophies took over. So you have one side, which is pure pleasure. Do what thou wilt. Right? Yeah, and your life's over. Not absolute truth. No, no, no. Do you ever notice that, these people? Well, I have my truth, and you have your truth, and it's really what you have, whatever you feel good about. What is that? That's the Epicurean philosophy. That's, that's what it is, right? You've heard that before. How many times have you heard that out evangelizing? Oh, I have my truth, and you have your truth, and my faith, and you have your faith, and if it makes you happy... Whatever makes you happy. Right. No absolute truth. He relied on experience as the test, not on reason. So he relied on experience, whatever he experienced. Epicureans taught that the gods were way out in space and really had no interest in man. And that, they, that, they, that the happiness of man depended on self-effort. You just got to make yourself happy. And ultimate pleasure, ultimate pleasure was to be free from anything that disturbed the human spirit. Whoa. Right? So anything that disturbed the freedom of the human spirit had to be done away with. Yes. Yeah, it is. Just a different flavor. They taught that freedom from pain, superstition, passion, and above all, the dread of approaching death should be paramount in the mind. The grave ended it all, so they must reach the height of this happiness now and in this life. Because that was it. Right? This life was the end of your happiness. This is the best it's going to get for you. This is your best life now. Right? It's humanism. That's right. That's exactly what it is. So the gods really don't have a lot to do. They, they thought they're just up in space, hanging out, having a good time, partying. They don't really care what you're doing. So you just need to have fun. You don't have any accountability. Just live your life. Do what thou wilt. It shall be the whole of the law. Right? Sound about right? That's what they believed. David Sorensen said this about them. He said, briefly, the Epicureans advocated the philosophy of enjoy thyself. They sought to present a philosophical basis for hedonism. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They sought to drape their sensual, licentious lifestyle with a cloak of philosophical respectability. So they tried to act real educated when they were nothing but a bunch of perverts. Right? That's what, I mean, they tried to be like educated. They had to try to put a sophistication around their perversion. Yeah. Really, they just gave themselves over to every lust. Yeah. But what they do, they tried to make you look like an idiot and them really smart. Yeah. Right? So like when you go preach to those professors in Northfield and we go down there and they preach and they, they tell us they know who God is and everything else and they, and they talk about all these, they're, they're hedonists. That's what they are. They're Epicureans. To this day, the modern academic and cultural elites of the universities and the cultural scene try to justify their immoral, profligate living with a veneer of philosophical foundation. They're philosophers. They're deep-thinking men, right? That's who they were. The Epicureans followed the teachings of Epicurus like we talked about. It was the philosophy of that eat, drink, and tomorrow we die. We talked about that. They, that's who these men were. Strong uh, McClintock uh, says a few things about them, uh, more than a few things. Oh, my goodness, if you, uh, yeah. No, it's not the whole book. Don't get scared. Um, but it is a lot of it. Actually, there's more on the Stoics than there, there are on the Epicureans. But I'm not going to read it all to you because it hurt my brain. I was like, these people are supposed to be smart? This is just dumb. I couldn't figure it. was too smart for me anyway. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, okay, whatever. What exactly are they saying? I don't understand. Let's see. Um, 
We'll read you a little portion of it here, though. Um, if you ever want to know about something that doesn't really matter a whole lot, just look in here. It'll be in here. And there'll be like 16 pages on it. It's just it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like, let's look up the Epicureans. Okay, there's like a book of them here. If you ever can't sleep at night and you need to sleep really quick, just borrow one of these volumes from me and look up a word like Everett. What does Everett have to do with the Bible? I don't know. Look, it'll be in there. It won't. I mean, you'll just... Federal theology, I mean, everything you want in here, every, I mean, some guy named Fabricus, who I don't know who he is, but anyway, he's there, and they're all in there. This, this is a 12-volume set of, like, double-columned, 1,000 pages each book. It does come in handy sometimes, though. Just not this week, really. <laughs> The Epicurean philosophy received its name. Uh, we talked about that. We won't go into that. Little was added to the system by its disciples. A except what happened was, as the system grew, it got worse. <laughs> they were full-blown. When the Roman Empire took over and everything was that they got perverted to the height of perversion. It got so bad. That's how wicked it was. Well, when you give yourself over to the flesh, what's going to happen? If you're a pleasure seeker, you're an Epicurean. If you seek pleasure in this life like that, that's, who you, that's the philosophy that you follow, which is nothing more than Satanism. Every sensation as every general conception was necessarily true, and we are here reminded, though in different modes and degrees, of the positions assumed. He talks about this. No guidance is accorded for the conduct of their understanding more assured than the immediate impression or the unregulated fancy, and the passions are thus left without any valid control by the reason. So reason does not control your passions. You just do what you want. Yeah. According to the natural impulses be, becomes, therefore, the aim and the duty of a philosopher. You see how bad that could get? So basically, like marriage, ah, it doesn't mean anything. You're, I mean, you just do whatever feels good. It doesn't, right? So you just have an open marriage, right? That's, yeah. that's how they looked at it. That's how, that's, that was their their logic in that sense. That was their philosophy. It says, in order to sanction pleasure as the guide of existence, it was necessary to get rid of the menaces of conscience and the terrors of heaven. At least they're honest about that. Hence, Epicurus practically denied the gods by relegating them to the eternal isolation of unconcerned indolence and revere. This was regarded by his votaries as the most essential service of his career. <laughs> he got rid of the gods for us. We have no accountability. This guy is great. We love this guy. <laughs> oh, again, they're honest. Anyway, so that's their view of God. Without divine sanction, without responsibility or existence hereafter, with neither reward nor penalty in a future life, for deeds done in the body, no real system of ethics is conceivable. There is no constraint, no obligation to rectitude. There is no moral compulsion. There is no domain for conscience. There can only be a more or less judicious and provident adaptation of actions to the judgments or dispositions of men and to the supposed satisfaction of the individual. Morality without religion is a pretense and a delusion, says one about it. A tranquil and a pleasurable existence becomes that of the sage, the gratification of every passion as it arises, the sole duty of an eager and undisciplined nature. Every restraint is removed except such as may be voluntarily imposed. And though cool and passive and indolent dispositions may maintain it external, in an, an external propriety of demeanor when exposed to no temptation, there can be no guarantee for rectitude or conduct, and the license of all passions will be gratified by the unclean beast who wallow in the Epicurean style." This is what he said about it. He was right. They were a bunch of dogs. Yep. That's what they were. So imagine the Apostle Paul is preaching to these people. He's right in the middle of preaching to these people. Now we come to the Stoics. They're the other group that's there. If you look in, the, in Acts chapter 17, you see Paul. It says here, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. The Stoics believed that God was embodied in everything material. They were pantheists, that God was in the spirit of trees, plants, animals, mountains, fields, 
and in a more intimate sense was in peoples. Therefore, to possess the ultimate in personal happiness was to be at peace with the world and everything it contained. Yeah, hippies. The Stoics, by contrast, advocated the philosophy of deny. No, actually, no, because the hippies gave themselves over to passions, okay? They get, the Stoics did not. They sought through self-discipline, singleness of pur purpose, and hard-driven regiment to achieve a higher plane of living. What would that be like? Like the Carmelite order. That's what it's like. Roman Catholicism, like asceticism, the mystics. That's what they did. Are you starting to see this? That's what they did. So they're the mystics. They were the ones that saw God as that. So they would punish their own flesh and push it down and beat it down and control it. And they thought that was the height of spirituality when they did that. Right? In some ways, they would be similar to the ambitious, hard-driving, goal-oriented professionals of our world who will climb over anyone or anything in quest for the top. Through the philosopher, though the philosophers and the philosophies of the Epicureans and the Stoics are no longer in vogue today, said David Sorts, and they still find the fulfillment in our modern ungodly world. That, like the orders, the Carmelite orders, uh, the Jesuits, they teach the same print, those principles to control your own flesh by doing it by your own strength and by meditation and by all those other things that you can control yourself. The Stoics, they were a sect of Greek philosophers who received their name from Stoa, a porch at Athens where Zeno taught. They were severe and lofty pantheists and affected indifference in all circumstances. Zeno was born at Sidium, a small town in the island of Cyprus. So, so he was, this man, it was to deny their emotions. They would suppress their emotions. So they are taught, they are taught in essence to suppress their emotions. How dangerous is it, right? Well, here's how dangerous it is. Uh, the result was self-righteousness and pride. The Stoics attempted to be unmoved by joy or grief, pleasure or pain. The result was self-righteousness and pride. Four of their chief leaders of the Stoics committed suicide. Why? Well, if you thought that you could contain and suppress all of your emotions, all of your passions, all of your desires, right? What do you think that's going to do when that fire breaks out? Or if it doesn't break out, what do you do? You kill yourself. Because you'll never get the victory over it. You can never, in and of your own flesh, you can never stop being a sinner like that, right? right. You can never stop having desires and passions. Well, the scriptures teach us the proper way to deal with desires and passions. The scriptures teach us that Christ needs to be the ruler of our soul, that Christ must lord over his people, that we are free in Christ, that we have a life in Christ, that we are given victory in him, and that he is our guide, and the spirit indwells us and teaches us all things and conforms us to the image of Christ. But the Stoics were taught to do it in their own flesh that they could attain to that, right? That they could attain to that and they could be strong like that and they could get the victory and not to show any emotions, right? Reminds me of the Jesuits um, in their training, some of their training, remember? Um, that uh, he, he taught Xavier and those other men, I think it was, wasn't it Xavier? Uh, and, and those other men, I forget what the other guy's name was. He taught them, um, Loyola taught them to suppress all of their feelings, all of their emotions, uh, starvation, hunger, whatever it is, to control all of those things. And they did it, obviously, by demonic power. That's what he was teaching them, yeah. right? I mean, all kinds of weird stuff we won't get into. But anyway, that's what he taught them. He taught them the same mystic teachings. That's the same thing. It's a similar thing, I should say. Same vein, right? It's all wicked. It's all vile, right? He taught that men should be free from passion, unmoved by joy or grief, and submit without complaint to the unvoidable necessity by which all things are governed. So the higher power, so to speak. Now, how is that different than, than 
than um, trusting God through afflictions. There is a difference. Because, see, we trust God, and God doesn't tell us not to have emotions. God doesn't tell us not to weep or not to cry or not to be moved by the death of somebody. He does, God doesn't tell us to shut off our emotions. In fact, He tells us to govern our emotions by Christ, to learn of Him, for He is meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, right? He tells us to learn of Christ and, to, and that our emotions are to be governed by Christ. They are to be governed by the Scripture. Let me give you an example of this, and I'm not going to get into it. Uh, you got enough. I think you get enough of the Stoics, so I'm not going to get into that. I don't want to read you. You'll be snoring by the time I'm done. They're kind of a boring group. But anyway, um, I wouldn't have sat and listened to them very long. But let me tell you this. Here's an example of this, and, and I'm going to touch on this. I'm going to teach on this coming up uh, fairly soon. I've been teaching through Mark chapter 5, but I'll give you a little, a little tidbit of it here tonight as we close out. The Stoics taught... You know, to suppress all that, what does God teach us to do? Well, God teaches us to handle our grief properly, that we are to grieve, then we're to grieve biblically. When, you know, uh, when Jesus, uh, when he went into the, the, the young lady that was, that was dead, and he said, she's not dead, she's sleeping, and they laughed him to scorn, right? And everybody around was mourning, and, and they were crying and everything else like that, and Jesus was very calm, and he was very plain with that. And just like Lazarus, when Lazarus had died, and he said, and, and you know, he said to him, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, and I go to wake him out of his sleep. Hey, man, I like that. One day he's going to come and do that for you. Your body's going to be in the ground. Your soul will be with the Lord if you're dead, and he's going he's gonna to wake you out of your sleep. Amen. He's going to wake that body up out of its sleep, right? But anyway, he said that. He said that, and he said he sleepeth, right? And... When you and I, as a Christian, handle death, we are commanded to handle it differently than the world does. We are told that we are to sorrow, but we are not to sorrow as if we have no hope. We are commanded against immoderate sorrow, immoderate grief, right? We are commanded against that. That means our emotions, our grief, right, is not, we are, it is not allowed to consume us. We are not allowed to allow our grief and our sorrow to take us completely over and to lead us. We are, to, we are to not sorrow as if we have no hope. We are Christians and we understand. If it's a loved one that has died that is a saved person, then we are to look to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our focus for our loved ones that have died in the Lord, we are given direct commands. No, you're not just to forget about them. You're not supposed to just act like they didn't die, suppress your emotions, don't cry, and get over it like that. No, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to remember the resurrection. You're supposed to concentrate and focus. Jesus said that at death. What did he say? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Right? That's, Jesus said that. So what does he say to us? Any time of death. By the way, when I die, if I die before all of you, which the way I'm going, I probably will. If I do, don't play the most somber music in the world. You better play some lively stuff at my funeral. Don't be playing no Amen. somber, sad music. It's a celebration. I went home. Amen. Right? Don't play no Presbyterian funeral music at my funeral. Right? Amen. You, better play some so you better play some songs about heaven. Yeah, don't burn me either. Right? I'll do that. But you know what? Don't, don't play that music. Why? And none of, you know what? None of us ought to play that music. We ought to play music about, they're going home. They're home. They're already in heaven. We're having this funeral, and they're home. We ought to rejoice in the resurrection. I'm not saying it's going to be fun. It's going to be hard. We're supposed to accept death, and, and we're supposed to sorrow. But we're also supposed to always keep our focus of our emotions on Christ, and at times of death, at the resurrection. That's where you're to focus. See, see how that's different than, the, than, the, than the, uh, the Stoics and those others that teach? No, we're to sorrow. We're to sorrow properly. There's a point of our sorrow that we are not allowed to be immoderate with. We're not allowed to be. You, you see these, um, and, and I'm not being racist either, but you go to some of these black funerals in Christian churches and everything else like that and they're wailing and yelling and hollering and screaming and i mean they're just they're just losing all sense of any deportment at all now there's nothing wrong with weeping and crying and doing there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing but 
What is wrong is for you to give yourself over to that and become completely immoderate with your emotions. You're to remember the resurrection. Now, what do I do when somebody that isn't with the Lord died and I have sorrow? I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You're to remember the justness of God. You're to remember how God is right. And you're to focus on how God is right. And you're always to focus on that. You are never to focus on, 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 it's too late for you to do anything about them being in hell. They made their decision. But what you are to focus on is Christ and how he is righteous and how he is, how he is worthy to be worshipped and how what he did was right and the judge of all the earth did right. Amen. You remember that when you have a loved one that went to hell, you remember that, that he is just he is holy, he has never made a mistake, and he is always right. Amen. And that's what you focus on. Not on not, not, nothing wrong with grieving the loss, but you remember Christ is right. That God is right. That God is holy, and he makes no mistakes. And no matter, I, I will grieve, and by the way, God grieved over Satan, over Lucifer falling. So there's nothing wrong with you grieving over that lost person in hell either. You ought to do that. I'm not, I'm not implying that you shouldn't. What I'm saying to you is it needs to be moderate. It needs to be with the end of it being the glory of God. That's how it needs to be. That's how you and I focus, and that's how you and I apply faith with our sorrow. Does that make sense? We're not Stoics. And we're certainly not Epicureans, right? We are Bible believers. Here comes Paul right in the middle. Next week, we're going to get to his sermon, right? Here comes Paul right in the middle, and he's going to preach him the truth. You're both wrong. He's going to lay them both out, right? And he's going to preach the gospel to them both, on both sides. He's going to preach about the God of the Bible, that is. So try to remember those things in dealing with your emotions, uh, don't ever encourage people not to show emotion or not to have any emotions. Uh, they need to have them. But immoderate tears and immoderate crying, it, it is a problem. Because if you allow your heart to be taken like that, then you'll start to blame God and say he's wrong. That's where your sorrow will lead you, that God's wrong. That's where it leads you. Immoderate sorrow for even a Christian will lead you to blame God. You'll blame God for it. You'll fault God. There comes a point to that where we can weep over our loved ones that died and went to hell. But then we have to give it over to God and say, God is right. He is just. He is holy. And I'm at peace with God because he's right. Right? He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that denieth not himself, taketh up his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. He cannot be my disciple. That goes with death, too. And that's a hard pill to swallow, friend. So I'm not making light of it, but I am trying to help you with it. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, well, bless God, you have the time to get saved right now. We don't have to weep at your funeral. We can rejoice. Trust Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you that we're not philosophers, but we're Bible believers. We believe this book. And Lord... Help us to love each other with our differences. Lord, you've taught us all a lot of lessons, and you've taught some of us that needed it the hard way because we needed it. But, Lord, help us to love each other. Help us to be able to love one another enough we can discuss things, we can shake hands, we can hug one another, we can go home and go about our business and come back and serve you again and do the things that we need to do and help us to be a good example to our children. And help us to teach them how to love one another. Lord, we're the only examples they have. God, help us to be the right examples. Help me. Forgive me for my failures, Lord, and help me and guide me and teach me. Thank you, Lord, for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.